All right, uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. This is Steve Wilson uh, from the State Water Survey, and I apologize for the delay. Uh, yesterday I was on a go-to meeting call, and uh, I, something flaky happened with my computer. I should have rebooted, and I didn't. And I'm pretty sure that's what my problem is. I went to get in to the webinar today, and <laughs> it would not let me in. So luckily Katie is just down the hall, and she's letting me use her computer, and uh, we'll go from there. So. Um, today we're here to talk about as if your water safe to drink and common questions about private wells. Um, again, um, this is hosted by the State Water Survey at the University of Illinois, um, and it's the private well class in this program is sponsored, funded, and supported by the Rural Community Assistance Partnership and US EPA, uh, who provide uh, the funding that allows us to do what we do. So today's webinar is part of a national program being implemented through um, RCAP, as I mentioned. Uh, it all supports uh, the material through privatewellclass.org. And one thing, one message for everyone today is that these webinars are not our class. We have a 10 lesson class that you can sign up for, and I'll talk about it several times today, um, that walks you through what it means to be a well owner and the things you need to know and understand. And so um, we record these webinars. This is being recorded and um, they're available on YouTube and through our website um, after the fact a few days later. And so you can see every webinar we've ever done uh, going back the last five years. So uh, if you're on the webinar today and you have, um, you need CEU credit as a uh, environmental health professional, this is the information you need. Um, their credentialing works such that you can only get credit for the same course once every two years. So I've listed the past webinars on the bottom right. Uh, Katie can get you access to those forms and I believe they're also listed on the handouts tab of your GoToWebinar uh, box or screen. So um, yeah, that's the kind of the logistics there. So depending on when your credentialing ends, it's a two year cycle. Uh, and we also do offer Illinois LEHP credit if you're um, an LEHP uh, person in Illinois. So uh, today, uh, again, I'm Steve Wilson. I'm a groundwater hydrologist at the State Water Survey, and Katie Buckley is with me. Um, she's a water resources outreach specialist also here at the State Water Survey. We both work on the private well program together. And during the presentation today, um, you probably remember when you registered, you were given an opportunity to ask questions. And we will go to those, uh, it's the second half of the webinar, if you will. Um, but if you have anything that comes up today that you uh, have a question about, go to the questions tab, or it might be called the chat tab on your go to webinar screen, and you can ask questions there. Katie's gonna monitor that, and um, uh, we'll make a list of those. We're, it's gonna be a little tricky because I don't have it uploaded uh, here, but hopefully we can work that out. And I just wanted to mention, um, for those of you who follow us, who have been a part of um, our webinars in the past, um, you'll you realize Dan Webb, um, he retired on November 30th. He ran our public service lab. And uh, you know, I really realized how much we rely on Dan um, when I went to go through all the questions that you all asked and advanced. Um, so we're working on um, a way around that, and um, so there, some of the more um, chemistry or sampling-related questions um, we will try to get to, but uh, uh, those I'm not as good at. Let's just put it that way. So um, our funding comes through RCAP, and we're actually their partner on our program. Um, we we actually work for them, if you will. Um, if you're not familiar with RCAP, it's a Rural Community Assistance Partnership. They're really six regional nonprofits that work together. Um, our national office is in DC, but they have staff on the ground in every state. And our private well program is fortunate that we have um, 14 to 16 staff among their regions that work just on private wells. Um, and so they do things like um, we developed an assessment tool, which is allows them to go out and work one-on-one -on -one with a well owner. Um, and so they implement that part of the program, the boots on the ground. They also hold in-person workshops where we do things by webinar. Um, they're doing uh, a lot of that work uh, in person and setting up local events with uh, health departments or soil water conservation districts or you name it, um, groups that are interested in protecting either a source aquifer or um, you know public health related to help well owners uh, be more safe, if you will. 
So um, I want to mention them, and if you want to know who your contact is from RCAP in your area, um, you can email us and we'll get you to the right person. And I mentioned uh, a well assessment. We developed this tool. It's basically a checklist that's uh, eight pages long um, on wells and springs, and it allows an RCAP staff person or others to come out and uh, do an assessment on, you know, is your well properly sealed? Do you store things that you shouldn't? Are there any vulnerabilities there, like you're in a karst area or um, you're in a floodplain? Um, it walks you through all these questions related to even if you have any kind of treatment, questions about your septic system, and in the end, it allows them then to give you recommendations on um, things you might want to be concerned about or things you might want to change if there are any, or maybe you're doing a great job and you already understand your well, um, so you may not have any of those things, but it's good to have somebody else look and uh, even find your well log uh, in many cases if one exists through a state agency uh, that houses that information. And it's, what it's really like, it's like a sanitary survey. If you're uh, someone who works with small communities or uh, works under the Safe Drinking Water Act, a sanitary survey is something that's required for every public water supply every three years. So we've developed this tool kind of to mimic some of the things on a sanitary survey, but it's really a chance uh, for a health department or a professional to educate a well owner about their situation. It's something I would encourage anyone who has a well to go through. Um, and it also, uh, you know, it teaches you a lot of things like some, there's a lot of really, um, what's the right word? Um, there's a lot of um, things that people think about well issues or about their health department that just aren't true. Like in Illinois, for instance, our public health department cannot tell you not to drink the water. They can't condemn your well and they can't um, make you do anything with your well. Once the well's in place, um, you're on your own to do that. A bank may require you to do some testing if you're going to sell your property or if you're going to buy a property, but um, they're there to be a resource for you and they want to protect your public health. So there's someone you should actually lean on and talk to, not someone you should be worried about, um, you know, giving you um, or causing you issues because, you know, they, they're they telling you not to drink your water. I mean, make no mistake, if if you know, the arsenic standard's 10, and if you have arsenic at 100 parts per billion, they may certainly strongly recommend that you and your family don't drink the water, but they certainly can't stop you and uh, can't make you not drink the water. So use those folks. They have a lot of good information, and um, that's one thing that you'll learn uh, is the rules in your area, so to speak, um, if you do a well assessment. And so RCAP's done a ton of these already, 1,800 or more around the country. They also do a lot of workshops, like I mentioned, and uh, we've done workshops as well, a four-hour training workshop for professionals where um, we're teaching them to use the assessment tool, and we've done, you know, had over 800 participants in that program. So hopefully more and more of those things are being done, and uh, yeah, it's a good group to, to know who the, they are and who your contact is. They can answer a lot of questions for you. So quickly, a little bit about the water survey. Um, we started in 1895 because of cholera and typhoid outbreaks and, and, uh, that was starting to occur around the country. So the water survey uh, was formed uh, through our chemistry department at the University of Illinois initially to investigate those and try to um, improve water quality standards. So we went out and worked with communities where there are cholera and typhoid outbreaks. We uh, took water samples at communities around the state and tried to document the quality of, of, of the water being used by Illinois citizens. And as an example, so our records go back that far, and uh, I show this on most of our presentations, but there's a huge story here that's not being told. Uh, Payne, Illinois had a typhoid outbreak in April of uh, 1916. Uh, the water survey staff went and investigated. Uh, it turned out the Payne Ice Cream Company um, was where the source of the typhoid came from, and it wasn't the ice cream. It was actually that uh, there were seven farmers who provided milk to the Pena Ice Cream Company. There was a large shared vat with a bucket that everyone used to get their milk, and that got contaminated. So everybody who went to the ice cream company to get milk ended up uh, had was where all the cases came from. And the ice cream company even put a note in their local paper saying that, yeah, we have this problem with our milk, but there's been no cases related to our ice cream. Please come still. Uh, you know, buy our ice cream, which is uh, 
kind of unique for the day, I imagine. So anyway, the whole point there is we've been around a long time. We work with water quality and quantity issues in the state. And we also house the state's well logs and a number of other things uh, that provide us an opportunity to really uh, work day to day with well owners uh, in Illinois. So things you need to remember as a well owner, um, they aren't regulated and it's up to you as the owner to make sure your water's safe for you and your family. And you can't go by taste, odor, or any of those things. Common contaminants like arsenic are colorless, odorless, and they have no taste. So you can't go by those things you need to test. And uh, I grew up on an old dug well that was only 14 feet deep, but now I live uh, in uh, Champaign-Urbana community on a community water supply. So the 40 or $50 I pay, um, as my daughter gets older, that keeps going up a little bit. Um, that I pay every month is spread out over all the residents for sampling, maintenance, and all the infrastructure. So when I turn on a tap, I have good water and, and what good water pressure. As a well owner, that's your responsibility. You know, you may wake up some morning, turn on a tap, and nothing happens. Well, maybe your pumps failed, or you need to figure out what happened. Um, you need to understand your well, and that's what our class really will do for you. We're certainly not getting into those issues today, and you need to know also who you can rely on. So the idea behind all this is being aware. Know where your water's coming from, um, how deep, what kind of aquifer, uh, what the water quality might be. Those things require you to have a well log and understand where your water's coming from, whether you have a screen or not, whether it's, so it's a, a bedrock well or a, a sand and gravel well with a screen. Um, if there's naturally occurring contaminants, there are areas in the country where there's arsenic or um, uranium or uh, other or, or corrosive water, just natural water that's corrosive that, you know, where lead could be an issue in your pipes. So through our class, you learn to ask the right questions and know who your local contacts of information are. And, you know, the other thing is you need to sample your well, and I'll say that a number of times today. So as far as testing, uh, always a lot of questions from everyone about getting your water tested and what I should test for and, you know, what do I do with the results and all those things. So we're going to go through some of that today. Um, and we're going to start off with where do you collect your sample. So usually uh, it's it's interesting, interesting because, um, you know, you're getting most of your drinking water out of your kitchen tap, I imagine. And so... Um, but that's gone through maybe a softener or filter or even an RO unit or some other kind of treatment. And it's also going through all the pipes in your home versus a spigot that may be out near the well that uh, is just going from uh, the well pump home straight to your, to uh, you know, your spigot or hydrant where it's not going through any of those things. So the water quality of those two could be very different. So the water you drink out of, if you're drinking out of a hose, like I did when I was a kid, may be very different from the water that's uh, you're getting out of your kitchen sink or is being used for cooking because it's gone through a softener or some other thing. So what our lab does, because part of our job as scientists is to understand both the groundwater quality and the drinking water quality, is we usually try to collect a sample at both. We also ask questions about how old your home is for piping issues, if you have any treatment, because that changes the chemistry. And so um, whenever you're going to collect your sample, um, you know, a good lab will also provide detailed instructions and ask some of those questions. And you just need to be aware of that. So um, we often suggest that you collect a sample both inside tap uh, in the kitchen tap and from an outside spigot or hydrant where it's before any kind of treatment and it's coming straight from the well. And obviously the outside tap is representative of your well water. We'll even usually, like when we go collect samples like that, we'll let it run for 20 minutes. We measure the pH and conductivity and make sure it's all stabilized so we know it's actually groundwater and not water that's been sitting in the column pipe, uh, that sort of thing. And then also one from your kitchen tap that's representative of the water you're actually drinking. And again, as I mentioned, they can be significantly different because of piping or chemist or uh, treatment. And uh, it's understanding and having both gives you a better understanding of what your source water issues might be versus things you can deal with in your home or treatment you may need to add um, or how treatment can affect uh, those things. And case in point, I've got an example of a homeowner who went through our lab and uh, this is, um, I think this is from 2015, yeah. So this is their raw water quality. This is their water quality from a sand and gravel aquifer and their well is about 230 feet deep, I think. 240, it says here. Um, interesting things here, the sodium's 25.9. Um, on the bottom uh, right, 
the hardness is 351 and uh, in the middle on the right the pH is 8.02 and it's got an uh, it's got a pretty high for a color units and turbidity which means it's got you know mineralogy in it and some of it's being oxidized and so we're seeing uh, you know turbid water a little bit it means it's there's nothing harmful here um, you know the arsenic's low and some of those things but um, it's pretty hard water so after their filter and softener they collected another sample and now the hardness if you look on the bottom right is down to 0.68 so it went from 351 to 0.68 which is what a softener is supposed to do so um, an un unintended consequence of using a uh, regular salt softener is the sodium went from 25 or whatever it was up to 198 so if you're on a low sodium diet just using regular salt uh, in your softener may cause your water to be pretty high in sodium which if you're on a restriction uh, for that it might be something you want to talk to your doctor about um, you can go to um, a different kind of salt a potassium salt and you won't have that sodium issue uh, for instance but they also have an ro unit a reverse osmosis unit under their sink which you know it's a membrane that basically takes a lot of things out so these uh, less than symbols on here are uh, it means below our detection limit and so a lot of things are already below detection but not everything and again i want to point out the ph is over eight of our natural water here and and i'll bring that up a couple times today related to chlorine and some other things um, but after their ro unit now it's taken almost everything out you know most things are below detection except boron went up and uh, even the sodium went down a lot but the ph also went down so the buffering of the water that keeps the ph high is now gone and so now it's it's you know below neutral it's 6.23 which is very mildly corrosive uh, depending on other water chemistry parameters but if you're in a source water that's already at six or five and a half, like, you know, the Piedmont Oxford in Virginia, I think the natural pH of that water um, is around five and a half. So that's typically considered corrosive, uh, depending on the rest of the chemistry, but in, in most cases. And so, you know, an RO unit is going to affect that even more. So um, just things to be aware of, unintended consequences, and why you need to understand uh, the water chemistry in your well and have someone who does understand that explain it to you. Um, as far as what to test for, it's really different depending on where you live, the type of well you have, all those things. You know, uh, some states allow galvanized pipe for their drop pipe, which has, you know, lead. Um, some states don't. And so there's just, uh, and also known contaminants. And I'll show you an example in a minute. We know there's an aquifer in Illinois that has pretty high arsenic. And so in that county, especially those couple of counties, we would always recommend that a well owner test for arsenic. But there's other areas where we never see it. So they probably couldn't skip that. Uh, for testing for arsenic so really the best person to ask is your local health department so they will usually understand and know if there's already an issue if there's a lot of private wells in the area other people you can talk to uh, the, the folks who um, maintain the state's well records in Illinois that's the state water survey in Wisconsin it's DNR and you know in uh, New York and Minnesota it's the Department of Health so it really depends you need to understand you can even just Google uh, state water well records you know missouri water well records is going to come up with missouri dnr and there'll probably be a link there where you can um, find a phone number and call somebody and you should rely on those people that's what they're there for so um, what we recommend is basically sampling for coliform and nitrate annually and those aren't necessarily harmful obviously nitrate um, is linked to blue baby syndrome so pregnant women and, and small children uh, under i believe nine or months to a year of age should not drink water with high nitrate but uh, there's scattered evidence about anything else and coliform bacteria itself isn't harmful it's e coli or fecal coliform that usually are, are our health risk we sample for those things because they're easy to find and they should not be in your well at elevated levels in the for, in the case of nitrate or at all in the form of coliform bacteria unless there's a pathway into your well so they're an indicator. That's why you probably heard the term indicator bacteria. It's a lot easier to test for coliform than it is you know, fecal or E. coli. So that's what they do because it, it means there's a pathway in and it's likely you, and a lot of times you may have both. Um, so that's really the whole, um, I wanna stress that the point of that is to uh, evaluate the proper construction of your well or 
also um, if there may be shallow sources of contamination uh, that your well's tapping into, like a feedlot or a septic system, or if you're in karst topography. So, um, so some examples. This is uh, Rhode Island, and there's two things on this figure, a bunch of very small dots, which are where there used to be a lot of orchards. They all used arsenic uh, as a pesticide until at least the 60s, and uh, and now the soil's contaminated, in some cases the groundwater's contaminated in those small areas. Uh, the big splotch in the middle, and that's the reason I show this slide, is because it's naturally occurring uh, beryllium, which when I found this on their website, which is probably four or five years ago now, um, I didn't realize beryllium was a regulated contaminant, but it is. Under the Safe Drinking Water Act, communities have to make sure there's no beryllium in their, in their water uh, it's, uh, got, because it has health risks. So it's not something you find in very much of the country, and I had never seen that before, but it's a, this is a good example of why you need to ask. You talk to the health department in Rhode Island, they would know all about this, I'm 99% I'm, uh, sure. And, well, actually this came from their website, so 100% sure. And uh, they can tell you what that means, why you should test for it, where you can get it tested, and all those sorts of things. But you can't just rely on some set list it really matters where you live. Um, other states have um, more helpful, if you will, websites that, uh, like this for Massachusetts, you type in your address, it'll tell you whether you're at risk for uranium or arsenic contamination based on all the testing they've done and all the work their state geological surveys done and their health agencies over the years to understand where that occurs and where it doesn't. And so this is one way, if you live in Massachusetts, that your State Department of, Public, of Environmental Protection has uh, developed a way for you to understand um, whether you should test for those things. And then even further, this is um, from Wisconsin De uh, Department of Natural Resources. They've mapped all of the sam private well samples that they have access to. And uh, it's an interactive map. So I clicked on arsenic by county on the top right. Um, I could have picked other things or a different uh, scale, if you will. And what it shows me is is the average level of all the samples they have in those counties. And you can see near Green Bay, where it's in the red, that the average water sample uh, in those three counties has arsenic at over 21 parts per billion, uh, or micrograms per liter, which the health standard for community water supplies is 10. And I say it like that because in most states, private wells have no legal limit. Um, you could drink water with arsenic of 200 parts per billion if you want to in Illinois. Um, and I've ran into people who say, you know, my grandpa lived to be 89. He drank this water his whole life. Um, I don't see a problem. And that's their choice. Uh, but it doesn't make sense when uh, there's a lot of health evidence to suggest that higher arsenic, for instance, does have health effects and can cause health problems, especially if you drink it for a long time um, over a number of years. But this is a kind of resource that's available. These things are becoming more common. You need to check with your state if they may have something. Um, some states do. Um, and that's just meant to be examples of the things you can find if you're just a little bit of an investigator when you go out uh, looking for this stuff. So here's what we suggest. And again, remember, we're suggesting a set list uh, for the entire country. Um, and that's why the bottom bullet there says, get advice from your local state health department. That's to cover the beryllium's of the of the country and other things that we may not recommend, like we don't recommend uranium, but we know out east, uh, the bedrock certainly has uranium in it. It's also some places out west. So uh, this is a list that, you know, what we suggest based on understanding a good general chemistry. And then also if you have, you know, for instance, galvanized piping, we'd recommend you test every three to five years for zinc and cadmium. Um, so it really depends on uh, what your situation is. So, you know, even knowing pH gives you a lot of good information um, along with uh, chloride and alkalinity about whether your water may be corrosive. And you can take that uh, sample result to someone to get a qualified answer. Um, so the other question then is usually when should I test my well? Well, besides coliformin nitrate annually uh, and every three to five years, to have a good background chemistry anytime you've opened up the well, really. And so if you've disinfected it, follow-up uh, should be taken to make sure that uh, the bacteria is gone. If you've shot chlorinated it, for instance, or any kind of emergency response. So if it's been flooded or there's been a fire. So, you know, there's actual recommendations for it. And this is a well in Colorado 
that was part of a forest fire and you can see the well caps been melted and the wires are melted. Um, we have a short video on our webpage explaining whenever you're in a situation where you may run into a fire uh, or maybe have a fire hazard, you know, you need to shut the power off to your well before you leave because of those wires melt together, it may run the pump and eventually just burn your pump up just because it's been running uh, for however many days before you can get back there. Um, also, you know, that cap, if any of that stuff melts and gets down in the well or that plastic, now you've got to be concerned about um, the water quality in your well is, and, and that sort of thing. So anything that affects your well is a good time to take a sample and ensure that your water is safe to drink. As far as getting it analyzed, you know, for the Safe Drinking Water Act and for all the communities in the country, the 50-some thousand uh, community water supplies uh, that have to sample uh, to make sure their water is safe. Um, so every state accredits labs. Um, some have their own labs as far as that are accredited as well uh, through EPA's National Accreditation Program. Um, so we recommend you use one of those just because they have to meet certain standards and uh, you know that the methods they use are the ones that are approved for those constituents. Um, I say that um, understanding that there also are some university labs like ours, uh, Texas A&M, Virginia Tech, that also do a lot of analysis. And uh, those are definitely, um, you know, we follow all the EPA protocols, but we're not certified just because of the cost to do so. Um, and, and I certainly stand by our lab, but um, as advice to you as a well owner, I would still recommend uh, you go to a lab that's been certified uh, through that program. And they should do everything for you. They should, you should be able to ask them whatever questions you have, and they should be able to answer them. And if they can't, I would find another lab. Um, and they should also provide all the information and bottles and anything you need uh, to do those samples, uh, especially detailed instructions and if you need to preserve it in any way so that you're comfortable before you start. Uh, you can contaminate samples pretty easy, uh, especially for bacteria, so it's important that you follow the instructions they give you. Um, as far as interpreting results, there's a number of web pages out there where you can put in your sample results and it will tell you um, what that means. Um, those are uh, I would recommend that you only use any of those sites as a first cut, if you will. You should always take your water sample to a health department uh, to get a qualified answer um, and ask them what you know these sample results mean. Um, one thing you can do recently, uh, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental uh, Services developed a web page that has one of those tools in it. It's called the Be Well Informed Guide, and uh, it's it's really cool, um, and it's it's managed by a state agency, so it's been vetted, if you will, and it's something you can uh, rely on. It was built for the residents of New Hampshire, but anyone can use it, and um, and it's a way for you to look at uh, your sample results and and uh, let you know if you have anything to be concerned about. So if you have a bacteria test, one thing I should mention: um, say you just test for coliform and it's positive you should go back and collect an E. coli test because that is, you know, the risk. Um, and either way, you should boil your water before you can chlorinate it and retest and make sure that it's uh, it's safe to drink before you do. So this is the Be Well Informed tool, and I'm just going to show you a short example. And you can Google that, Be Well Informed Guide, and it'll come up. If you click on the bottom left where it says enter your water, water test results, it asks you, you know, what town or city you're from. I put in anonymous. I put in arsenic at 15 micrograms per liter. So the units there is a drop down, and that's one improvement and why I like this site so much. Um, many of the other ones just have milligrams per liter, and you have to convert it yourself. So for our private well class, we have a pretest and a post test, and one of the questions asks you to convert units, I think, from milligrams per liter to parts per billion. And out of, you know, we've had over 77 or 800 people take our class so far. Um, and about 5,000 of those have done the pretest, and um, only 27% got that right. And so it's a matter of if you get your results back in one unit and you have to convert it to another, um, you know, you need to be careful what number you actually put in there. And this one has a drop down, so you can put it in whatever units the lab gave it to you in, which is pretty handy. Um, so we put in 15 micrograms per liter, which the standard's 10. So when we uh, hit return, it comes back with the red X and says, you know, arsenic 15 uh, is above the health standard reads 
or 0 0.01, which is 10 micrograms per liter, but they have it as 0 0.01 milligrams per liter. So um, they're telling you that's something to be concerned about. They list the types of treatment you can use, and I'll point that out here because there's a question about this, and I, I'll get to it later. Um, this is an older slide. This is what it used to say. It doesn't say this anymore. They don't recommend RO anymore, and I'll talk about that later. But there's really two ways, and they're both point of use, which means under the sink, uh, not point of entry, which means your whole house. And so they recommend either absorb, uh, absorption media filter systems or RO. And RO does work. It's just there's some complications there, and I think that's why they stopped recommending it. Um, it also talks about treatment. And um, the thing to point out here is at the bottom under treatment options, there's a one or a two. One says NSF ANSI standard 53, and the other one says NSF ANSI standard 58, and that's for RO. The 53 is for um, absorptive media. Um, when you go to buy a treatment device, if you're going to do that, if it doesn't say it meets NSF ANSI standard 53, if like if you're going to buy an arsenic absorptive media filter to put on your kitchen tap, um, you're taking a risk. So there's third-party certifiers that make sure that equipment works well, NSF, um, Underwriters Laboratory, and the Water Quality Association all do certification, and they test that equipment to make sure it does what it's supposed to do, or at least you know under a certain standard. Like they may uh, put water at 150 ppb of arsenic through those filters, and they show that they drop them below the health standard of 10. And so I would only use certified uh, products just because uh, there's a lot of other equipment out there that's not certified. Um, it'll be a little more expensive, but you um, are guaranteed of a result. And if it doesn't perform like it's supposed to, you can return it and you have some uh, response uh, to deal with that. So um, again, I want to point out that those tools like the even the Be Well Informed Guide is really for typical water. Sometimes you run into a really unique set of water chemistry. You know, groundwater is complicated, geology is complicated, and so I would always take your results to the health department and have someone, uh, a health professional, evaluate that uh, based on uh, that actual data and listen to what they have to say. Again, they're there to help you and make sure your water's safe. Um, yeah. So uh, one other point I want to make that's a, a big issue is well construction. So I mentioned we sample for coliform and nitrate to determine whether there's a pathway into your well. So when um, every state but two have well construction code, um, Pennsylvania and Alaska, and I know they both, uh, a lot of folks in both of those states wish that wasn't the case and they're working to try to change that. So, um, but well construction code, even in states like Illinois where we've had a well construction code since 1968, has changed a lot since then. Um, it's been updated, it's been changed, there's different uh, things that we've learned. And so most existing wells today may not meet the well code for your state. And, and any old wells, like the well I grew up on, was hand dug by my grandpa in 1933. Um, it totally does not meet code. It's actually, we know it's a risk. Um, it was always that way. And um, the one thing you can do is make sure your well is safe and it does meet code and uh, talk to someone, uh, you know, and a well assessment would help with that as well. But um, like the well I grew up on, um, it's still in use today. And um, yeah, so these old wells though that are, or hand dug wells are wells that are in pits. Um, the problem is they provide an opportunity for contamination, um, you know, especially in cold climates. If uh, your well cap, even if it's, you know, a sealed well cap has a gasket in it, that when you put it in, seals just fine. But over a number of winters and summers where it gets hot and cold, they become brittle just like any other gasket would do. And eventually, uh, that, and that's the last thing that people think about changing. Um, you see no recommendations to go out every five years or every 10 years and change the gasket on your well cap. But it's something that probably should be done. And so uh, what that means is if your well's in a pit and it gets flooded because of a heavy rainstorm, there's likely water seeping into your well from that pit, uh, which could also have snakes in it or, you know, a lot of other things. So a couple of really bad examples. Um, the picture on the right, is that's a dead goat. And um, this is a, a, an old hand dug well. You can see the brick down at the bottom. They put a concrete casing, um, you know, a tile 
uh, for the upper uh, four feet or so. But uh, this is a really old well and uh, it was open and um, Don Kellerman um, saw the dead goat in there and took a picture of it. So this well was not being used at the time, but it had been and uh, still could be. And so, um, you know, that's a, there's no reason to have a three foot diameter open hole um, near an old farmstead. And that was the case here. And the one on the left, you know, the Washington State Department of Ecology is the uh, state organization that licenses drillers and manages well construction code. And so they have a blog where they put out information uh, about wells. And there's a number of good pictures they have uh, put up. In this case, this is an old, you can see the corrugated uh, pipe there that makes up the well casing and the pump, the blue pump sitting there. Um, there was a piece of plywood over that. A uh, woman who lived there had uh, stepped on that probably, you know, who knows, 50 or 200 times. This time it broke, she fell in and it killed her. And uh, the problem here though is you see the funnel sitting there and you see the broom up in the upper left and it looks like old insulation that's kind of falling apart and it's laying around on the floor. You know, this isn't the kind of water supply you want to have stuff dropping in and uh, becoming part of your uh, well water. And so really this should have been, this whole setup should have been uh, sealed up, changed uh, with a, you know, uh, brought up to code. Um, and that was the result. So yeah, what to do, bring them up to code. And sometimes it's a small thing, like maybe your well, maybe your state's rule now is um, that a well should be, uh, the top of the well should be 18 inches or more above land surface, and your well's only six um, because it was installed a long time ago. Well, if you're in a spot that's on, on higher ground where there's really no chance uh, and water runs away from the well and there's no chance of flooding, being only six inches probably isn't a big deal and you don't need to do anything about it. But if your well's down in a pit and every time it rains, that pit fills up with water, then it's time to, to fill that in, bring the pipe to the surface, and then um, have it you know, disinfected and properly um, brought up to code. Um, the other problem is abandoned wells. So the, the State Water Survey probably has about 500,000 well logs on file, and we expect that there's at least 800,000 to a million wells actually in use, plus a lot of uh, old farmsteads and homesteads that have a well that's in use also have an old well that's somewhere uh, on the property but not being used anymore and it hasn't been properly abandoned or filled in. So there's actually in most states more undocumented wells than there are wells on file. And uh, we run into that all the time. We try to find a well log. Um, you know, I did a study uh, 10 or 15 years ago where I had five geology students go out into a rural area uh, of five townships uh, nine townships, excuse me, they found 1,708 wells, and we only had logs for 788 of them. So a state of, like Illinois, where we're kind of ahead of the game as far as permitting and keeping well logs, we had less than half of those wells. And again, that's a very rural area. Many of the homes uh, are very old, and so that that's what we'd expect. Um, we're in an, you know, in an area like a Collar County of the Chicago area where there's a lot of newer wells, we probably have the majority but uh, just the same, there's a lot of old wells out there that end up being found when somebody falls in or a tractor gets stuck or, you know, livestock get killed. And this is, um, those should be sealed. And they can also be a source of contamination as, um, you know, if people pour stuff in them, you see this nice hole in the ground. Sometimes um, people think that's a good place to dump things. We see that a lot in karst topography where a sinkhole develops. Um, in southern Illinois, you could drive along uh, a county road and see a bunch of sinkholes, and they're all full of wire and old uh, pieces of metal and tractor tires and things that people just want to get rid of. Uh, really stupid to do. Uh, so, for example, these two pictures, again, are from um, the Washington State Department of Ecology and from their blog. And the one on the bottom, you know, there's a video associated with that, and the guy fell 45 feet, and he, and he didn't get hurt. Uh, very lucky. And the other one, they're trying to get a horse out of an old well. Um, so the, uh, not to to expand on this too much, but, but the four newspaper clippings, three of those are from Illinois. 
and you know these are all from the late 90s. Uh, the third one down is about Jessica McClure, the little girl that was trapped in a um, a well in Texas, and it was covered live on uh, CNN for 18 hours, I believe, uh, while well, they tried to get her out of there. And it really shed light on the issue, um, but it happens a lot more than people realize, and that's the message here. Um, you just don't necessarily hear about it all the time. So um, I want to talk a little bit about our class. And again, um, the private well class is an online, um, it's not even really an online class. It's a self-paced program where you sign up with your email address and it sends you a lesson once a week for 10 weeks to your email address as a PDF. You're on your own to take it. You're on your own to actually read it. And um, you know the issue there is uh, a lot of folks think these webinars are our class and the private well class has a lot more of the details and direction that really help you as a well owner understand what you need to do and what you need to know. And so um, if you go to our website, this is the front page, it's just privatewellclass.org. Click on the button right in the middle that says take our free class. Um, and it takes you to a page where you can sign up and all it asks is what state you're from, uh, your first name and your email address. And that's really so that we can track the number of people taking our class and show uh, RCAP and the EPA that folks all over the country are actually taking our class. And it's interesting, we see where some of the state agencies have taken an interest in our class. We see a lot more people taking it in those states than others, um, but it, it varies. And it also varies by the number of wells in each state. So for each lesson, there's six to 10 pages of material in the lesson. And then this is a resource library that's also on our website. You can see it clicked on the resource library in the upper right. And for each of the 10 lessons, there's a set of other materials that are available publicly and free online from other sources. They were either used to help write the lesson uh, somewhere, and some were also just supplemental material that cover the same things as uh, that lesson. So for instance, under lesson two, groundwater and well contamination, the first thing there is a Michigan flowing well handbook. It's really cool. Michigan uh, was losing 28 million gallons a day to uh, wells that flowed. And so they passed a law and they now you have to cap those. And so it's got all the information about the law, uh, best practices for capping a well and some other information. It's probably one of the better sources I've ever come across about flowing wells though. And we do have a couple places in Illinois where we have flowing wells. So it was really interesting to me when I ran across that and I included it. So, cause I know there's a lot of other areas like that. Um, we put on webinars like the one we're doing today on a number of different topics. So every July we do a webinar on septic systems, for instance. And so those are all recorded. If you go under webinars and events, there's a button for upcoming webinars, which takes you to a page where you can register and also one for past webinars where it brings you to a page that has all of the past webinars listed by date. And so um, you can see last month's, it was for realtors. That would be the first thing that shows up on that page now. But you can watch this, and, and I'll say this a couple times probably, but um, the one thing about our webinars, even the septic system one, a lot of the core content in the first half is the same. Um, but the questions are almost always different. So it depends on who's on the webinar, who asked the questions, and what questions they asked. And so it's really worth going through our webinars uh, at least the back half, if you will, uh, during the question section, and um, to see some of the different questions that were asked and how we answered those and the information we provided. A few things like, how do I disinfect my well, or should I be pouring bleach down my well, we get asked every single time by a number of people, and so I am going to cover that today, um, but if you go back to some of these other webinars, you'd see that same information. Um, we also do webinars on specific topics like lead. We've done this twice. We did it in 2016 and 2018, just to help people understand, you know, the thing in Flint, Michigan was a, a, a management error. They switched their water source and they stopped using uh, corrosion inhibitors and it led to their, uh, the same pipes that have always had lead on in them, uh, but were protected by uh, scale formation. Um, the water became corrosive, the scale went away and then they started leaching lead. That can also happen in your home. So you, if you have lead pipes or lead solder um, and your water's corrosive, um, it can leach lead into your water. And so um, it's really more of a home plumbing issue. Uh, very few places in the country actually have natural lead in water. Um, 
and and I yeah I've never worked in a situation where I've seen that but I know it does occur um, it's almost always because the water's corrosive so the pH may be low or it's high in alkalinity or whatever and um, then their pipes have that as a source and so um, this is a good video to watch and most of this is not me it's an expert on lead and private wells from Virginia Tech who uh, came on and provided um, all of her expertise for us so um, and then we also for some of these things like for lead and even for like realtors and environmental health professionals we have uh, pages set up with more information so like this is privatewellclass.org slash lead and you can get to this page where you can get more resources things about the filters that take them out take lead out um, resources from CDC and EPA things that are important uh, for you as a well owner uh, to know and understand um, we've also created uh, now I think we have 18 we we'll hopefully have a few more here pretty soon short four to six minute videos on different topics how does my well work what is a sand and gravel aquifer what should I know about a shared well you know most people take for granted if they're on a well and they share it with their neighbor uh, it, but that happens a lot and it may be that originally there were three homes on one well and it was a father and two children and he built their houses they've all moved on um, and now it's three different people there may be no legal agreement in place uh, there's a lot of things that can happen and all of a sudden somebody buys that property that actually has the well on it and they don't want to share anymore you may be without water and finally you have to drill your own well so there's a lot of issues uh, related to shares wells and you know whether or not um, you have those things in place even when a pump fails having an agreement on who's going to pay what or if you're putting money into a fund all that can affect uh, your neighbors you uh, your ability to have water and so there's just a lot of things to consider and it happens a lot more than people realize also some things about your well system like you know why does my well keep losing pressure or how does my pressure tank work by far the most clicked on video we have is one called what how does my pressure tank work and I'm sure it's 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 close to 300,000 hits already and uh, since 2016 um, is very popular and that tells us two things one there's not a lot of information out there about your uh, people's pressure tanks and two a lot of people have varying or poor or water pressure they don't understand why it is the way it is and they want to understand it better and so it's a really good short way to understand how your pressure tank works and these are the old style not the new ones with variable speed pumps but ones with a constant pump uh, where it uses a pressure tank to keep your pressure at a certain level and so it's just really good information we have podcasts we've only done the first three lessons um, but we also have uh, been on RFD Illinois which is the radio station for Illinois Farm Bureau and uh, talk to them um, about abandoned wells and just uh, wells in general and what private well owners need to know and uh, so those are all available as podcasts and then um, we've developed a version of the entire class in Spanish. So you can click on the button in the middle and you'll get all the lessons in Spanish. Um, there's actually, I can't remember how many of the videos we we put into Spanish, but a number of those 16 videos are also in Spanish. And I think we did maybe three webinars in Spanish. Uh, and I was very fortunate, you know, being at the University of Illinois and the resources we have, we found the civil engineering student from Columbia and his spouse, uh, who both were excellent and uh, helped us put uh, the videos and this uh, Spanish version of our class together. They both went back to Columbia this last September, and uh, so uh, we're on our own and looking uh, to do any more of that right now anyway. So the bottom line is the goal is um, we're trying to teach you uh, the basic information you should know about your well. I have so many well owners who say, you know, I don't know anything about my well, or um, I've even I have even uh, water operators from small community water supplies tell me that yeah I had a guy call me complaining about not having any water pressure and it turns out he's on a private well he thought he was on city water you know I don't understand how that can happen but it does a lot more than uh, you might realize and I've you know, a number of stories like that and so you know you need to understand why your well is important how you, how it works and then what you can do to protect yourself from any risk and that's the goal of our class and our program and hopefully uh, hopefully we're succeeding there um, so the rest of the time we're going to talk about um, 
the questions we've got. So if you, when you registered, you're given an opportunity to ask questions. Um, there was probably well over 100 questions, and obviously we can't answer all of those today, but we um, I'm trying to answer a number of those. And uh, also during the webinar, you've had a chance to uh, write questions uh, to Katie on the question box or in the chat box, and uh, she's making a list of those in a Google Doc that we can share, um, which we'll have to take a short break because I'm not at my computer, uh, unfortunately. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, all our past webinars all have questions that people ask too. And um, many of you, if this is your first time on one of our webinars, uh, that happens every time. And so um, the questions are different. Sometimes they're really on obscure topics. Um, we try to answer what we can and uh, those are all available. So again, as I mentioned before, it's worth going to the second half of a lot of those videos to look at the questions and see if uh, they may be different. And even, you know, the last time we did this webinar, I believe was in June, um, you know, the questions this time are different from the questions last time. And so even though the front half of that video is gonna be pretty similar, uh, not exact, um, the second half won't be. And as an example, I went to um, our septic system webinar from July, which I showed earlier, and went, this is about two thirds of the way through. Um, I'm not a septic system expert by any stretch of the imagination. And so um, RCAP uh, Solutions, which is the Northeast RCAP, um, their Massachusetts lead, his name is Jim Starbird. He uh, was a sanitarian for eight years and is a septic system expert. And so he graciously has helped us the last several years with our septic webinar and answers most of the questions. And that's why there's no responses uh, below each of these. It's because Jim answered them on the, on the webinar. But, you know, they're all septic related. They're much different than the questions we have today. And so, um, you know, I'm assuming most of you have a septic system. If you have a private well, not everyone. Um, and so if you want to learn more about your septic system, <clears throat> excuse me, you can go to this webinar from July and, and find more of that stuff out. So, uh, new well owners. So what's the most important thing a homeowner who has never had a well before should know? And I just bought a home and, you know, I need to know more about it. So, uh, honestly, the first thing to do is just take our class. Once you've done that, um, you'll be able to ask better questions and understand, uh, you know, we provide a list of what you should do uh, each year besides sampling, you know, check your wellhead, make sure it's not been hit, um, not store things, no, you know, there's just a lot of uh, get your well log, you know, understand all those things. The first thing to do is to go through all the information we've already provided. And once you've done that, um, then come back and ask us more questions. And that's, you know, my advice, um, because we get a lot of questions every time. As someone new to a well, I know nothing about wells. How do I find local information? We have one of our 10 lessons is just about how to find local information. It's such an important thing. You know, we can't uh, help every well owner in the country. There's 17 million wells out there and 40 million plus people who are on private wells and you need to take care of it yourself. You're the water operator for a very small water system. Uh, it's one of the messages. So, um, you know, being on this webinar is certainly a great start, but sign up for the class and take it. It's information you can print out and keep, um, and it will help you understand enough of the basics that you can ask better questions of us, of a driller, of a pump contractor, extension, uh, health department, all those folks. Uh, even, you know, the geologists, you know, um, it should give you the confidence even to call like your state geological survey and try to find more information about the geology and the water quality issues you might have, depending on where your well's at and how deep it is and all that stuff. So that's the that's the real message here. And it's just privatewellclass.org. It's, it's easy to sign up, click on one of those two buttons, and then uh, you can take care of that. So someone asked uh, who's a, a well professional or someone who works with well owners, um, I'd be interested in free print resources to hand out at our county office to share with the general public. Um, we just, uh, this is a brochure we put together about two years ago, and it's, is your well, well water safe? It's got our information on it, and it talks about the three steps that a well owner should go to as a first basic um, uh, list of things to deal with. And we even left space above private well or below private well class and above the RCAP logo. So you could put your own like county health department logo on there as a label. Um, we've already 
had two printings. We just sent the third one to the printer. The first two totaled 47,000, and those were requests based on, uh, we sent that out through our newsletter for professionals and also through the National Environmental Health Association's newsletter. And uh, so there's close to 400 uh, organizations, which are mostly counting state health departments and state labs um, or extension offices who've requested these. Um, we did order extras, so if you email us, we can probably get you some. Um, but this is the one thing that we put out that was really meant to be just for this purpose, something that a county health department can stick on uh, their front window, uh, you know, in a little holder for people who come up to the front desk, things like that, just so that people can take it if they want it and they understand um, that this is all free. And so, um, you know, the best advice I have for this, um, we literally sent the order in last uh, or on Monday, uh, two days ago. So um, we can probably get you some of these, a couple hundred if you want them. Um, just let us know and uh, email us and, and on our webpage. Uh, it's info at privatewellclass.org. Um, so is sewer water better than well water? Uh, I really struggled whether to even put this up here. Um, but I, you know, the point here is, um, well, well water can really vary. You know, we've already talked about the beryllium problem in uh, Rhode Island and uh, uranium in Massachusetts and other areas out east. So there's really no blanket statement that would ever cover whether a particular well is better or worse or safe. But uh, sewer water, um, you know, I work with a lot of small water supplies, community water supplies. And when I think of sewer water, I'm imagining the sewer line that runs from someone's home to their wastewater treatment plant. And our wastewater treatment plants do have to meet specific water quality parameters before they can discharge their water to a stream or a, a, a you know, water body that's a public water body. So um, I, to me, there's no question. I'd always go with well water. But... Uh, the thing to understand here and, and what I wanted to point out is there are over 17 million private wells in the country and, again, serving over 40 million people. Most of those wells have good water quality. It's not like every well is contaminated or well water is bad. You have to take care of your well. You have to sample to know what your water quality is. And most water quality problems in a well aren't the water, isn't the aquifer. It's poor construction not sealed properly, surface contaminants that can leach in, or having a shallow well that's not uh, that's going to get water from the surface, like a sand point. If uh, you know what a sand point is, um, it's a really cheap way to put in a well when you're in a sandy area where the water table is shallow. So you can use a, uh, a sledgehammer and drive a sand point 20 feet and have a water supply, but you get what you pay for. You're going to have a well that has there's no grout, there's nothing protecting stuff from the surface from getting in, and you're actually so if you're applying any kind of chemicals near your well and you have a really shallow well, you're going to get those chemicals in your water. So um, you need to understand how your well's built if you're in a vulnerable geology like sand or karst, and um, what your particular situation is. Every well is a little bit different. You run into all kinds of situations, so you need to understand yours and. Um, so, and again, just like your car, you have to take care of it. You have to change the oil in your car, right? Or you should, um, or it's going to eventually not work anymore. In the same way, you need to sample every year, make sure your well's safe. You know, I grew up on a farm where our well, um, I couldn't run over it with a, a, a mower, you know, or a tractor. But um, a lot of people don't. They have a well that's a PVC pipe that's sticking up in the middle of their yard. And I know when I was mowing, with our little H tractor, um, a lot of times in road gear, which, you know, is pretty fast. I hit posts. I hit all kinds of stuff. You never know when somebody's going to hit that well, uh, back into it, crack the casing. And uh, the best example I have is one of the RCAP folks uh, was looking at a well in Virginia, and they um, they had a well that, you know, was right out in the middle of the yard. Nothing, you know, it's right out in the middle of the yard. There's nothing around it. Well, they sent me a picture, and sure enough, it's right next to a tree that's 18 inches in diameter, and it's a PVC pipe. So what had happened is they kept having coliform problems, and it's because the roots grew around the well, um, because that's where the dirt had been disturbed, and it was easiest for the roots to grow, and eventually squeezed that enough that it cracked the casing. So tree roots have a lot of bacteria. All that stuff was able to get in the well, so no matter how many times they chlorinated it, they were getting bacteria, having uh, coliform problems and bacteria problems. So, 
you know, you got to take care of your well. Um, their solution is to take out the tree and line the pipe with another pipe and make it smaller or build a new well um, in that case. So you need to understand there should be nothing around your well um, at all. It uh, needs to be by itself in a place where it's not going to be disturbed. So uh, another next question was, if someone has a contaminated well, say from high bacteria levels in a shallow and confined aquifer, is it feasible to drill a new well into a deeper confined aquifer? It is totally feasible, depending on your situation. You need to understand the geology. Every location, just like some people have oil under their property and they're very fortunate, some don't. Some have water under their property, some don't. Some have three or four water sources under their uh, property uh, and some don't. So. Um, I grew up in an area where we had no real aquifer, so we had a hand dug well. Um, and there's a lot of people in, say, southern Illinois where they still have large diameter wells that are bored because there's no real good water uh, available deeper uh, in the bedrock or the water quality is poor. We have a shallow bedrock aquifer in Illinois that's at less than 400 feet in some places um, that's salt water, it's seawater. So you can't really drink that, or I certainly wouldn't want to. So the thing to do is um, understand the geology of your property and location. And one of the best ways to do that is contact your resource agency, which would be like your DNR or DEQ um, or your state geological survey, and ask them, here's my property, here's my legal description and location. Um, we do that for well owners almost every day. People call us and ask questions. I live in Champaign County, Township 22 North, Range 6 West. Um, I just bought these five acres. I'm going to build a house. What can I expect for, my, for a well I need to drill? We can tell them exactly what they can expect from all the other wells that are near them we have the logs for. And I show this picture here because um, one of the largest aquifers in Illinois is the one just above bedrock on the bottom of this map that's kind of yellow. And it says the Muhammad sand member and the San Cody sand member and the uh, and the Muhammad and Mackinac bedrock valleys. This aquifer runs all the way across the state. It's a large uh, old riverbed from when bedrock was land surface and then the glaciers filled it up. So there's as much as 200 feet of sand down on that bottom sitting on top of bedrock, which is the white part at the bottom there. But we've had three uh, or four glaciations in some parts of the state at different times. So anything, you can see what it says, sand and gravel in the legend at the bottom, any of those with the little dots in them are all, are all sand and gravel and it could be a water supply. So the red line on the left is meant to be a well or a drilling, uh, a borehole, and it only hits one thing. It hits the San Cody sand member down at several hundred feet. Everything above that is, is soil or um, organic matter or organic soils or clays or tills. So they would have to drill there, say, two or 300 feet to hit the sand and gravel, whereas the red line on the right, um, they get down into this unit C1, which is a, the, uh, is a glaciation, and there's a thick sand uh, at the top of that C1 and also at the bottom, and then they hit a small sand right, by, right below to the right of the B, um, and then they don't hit the Muhammad at all, which is unusual. Um, so you have three choices there, and all those might have different water chemistries, and that's not even including then uh, the Silurian or Pennsylvanian age bedrock that's below that, which also can be a water supply. So um, the geological survey in your state will know this stuff for your area and be able to tell you what your options are. Also, the agency that keeps the well logs um, will have this information about wells that have already been drilled near there in that location, and they should be able to tell you if there's a deeper aquifer or not uh, that's potable. Because um, sometimes the water quality will limit this as well. So uh, arsenic issues. Um, I tested my well and it is eight times the EPA recommended level of arsenic, which the standard through the Safe Drinking Water Act is 10 parts per billion. Um, I can't afford a whole house filter. Is it true arsenic doesn't absorb to the skin? Um, and they also had an issue about a swamp cooler, which I'll be honest, I had to look up. And so basically it adds uh, it evaporates water and adds moisture to the air, which cools it. So it a, a, uses water to cool the air, which is really cool. Um, so um, arsenic is not an inhalation or dermal issue. And uh, we've been asked this a number of times. And so I went to the Minnesota Department of Health, which uh, those folks are really on their game. And uh, so I'm assuming eight times the 10 is 80. And unless it's super high, you know, there's areas in the country where arsenic might be at two or 3,000 uh, parts per billion. Um, unless it's up, you know, very high, 
it is not an issue for uh, inhalation or dermal uh, use. So you should be able to take a shower and not have a problem at all at 80 ppb. So um, you don't need a whole house filter. You uh, For arsenic, you really only need a, a one for your drinking water and your cooking. Um, so I mentioned earlier the New Hampshire Be Well Informed tool used to mention RO, and the example I showed listed RO, but they don't anymore. And uh, the reason why is because arsenic can exist in two oxidation states in the ground, a plus three and a plus five. And so um, RO works really well on the more oxidized plus five state, but it doesn't work as well on the plus three. And sometimes, um, you know, we see where it maybe only takes out 20 percent. So I, I'm, I don't know. I haven't talked to them. Um, but I'm guessing that's why they stopped recommending RO. And so they really only recommend two things now. They recommend for point of use, the absorptive media filter system, which I explained earlier. And then for point of entry, if you wanted to put a whole house arsenic filter on, which, you know, there really is no need, um, you would use anion exchange followed by an acid neutralizer, which would be one really expensive and a huge waste of water. Um, yeah, it, it can be. Um, so. Uh, that's our best advice for that. Um, and you can't readily get, uh, when you send arsenic in to a lab, they don't regularly spe speciate it between three and five. Um, there are labs that can do that, but then there's certain uh, conditions for how you collect the sample to make sure you're not converting it yourself because it's exposed to air and, um, you know, it'd be a more complicated process. So, um, but there is a solution. The absorptive media systems seem to work really well and uh, they can be put uh, on your kitchen tap. Um, how do consumers know early whether water lines are being corroded or affected by any microbial treatment? And the question really here is about lead. Um, really the way to understand this is just to test for lead. Uh, you need to test your water and a first draw sample um, will give you, if there, if there is any kind of corrosion, any lead in your water, your first draw sample is gonna be the most likely to show it. And that's why for some uh, places in some homes where they have lead, they'll say don't use the water until you've let it run five minutes because it's the water that's been sitting in your pipes and, and been exposed to that that lead uh, and had a chance to actually corrode it uh, that's been sitting there overnight that's going to have a higher value. And so, um, you know, also if you sample and you sample for the things we recommended, you're going to know what your pH is and uh, alkalinity and those will give you a better idea of whether your water's corrosive or not. Um, and this said, or affected by any microbial treatment, and I'm assuming that means chlorine, because, you know, to disinfect. Um, and liquid chlorine, anyway, actually raises the pH. So it wouldn't um, necessarily affect it in that respect unless it was really high already uh, and it became really alkaline and that caused a problem. Um, but the thing to know, and I'll mention this again, is that as the pH goes up, the effectiveness of chlorine as a disinfectant goes down. And uh, actually over eight or so, it's not uh, necessarily the best choice. So uh, as for getting, there's a lot of questions uh, you all asked about bacteria and disinfecting. And so um, we, I put together a number of slides here together just to talk about this issue. Um, I have total coliform in my well. Can I use it? What's an acceptable coliform count? Um, and how can I treat it? So but again, bacteria contamination occurs when a well isn't properly constructed or the well is getting water from a shallow source that's near or a bacteria source like a uh, you know, feedlot or something like that. So knowing where your water's coming from and knowing um, you know, how deep your well is. And it matters whether you have, uh, and I didn't put this in this presentation, I probably should have, uh, a sand and gravel well has a screen. So water can come in, but the sand can't. And so the screen is usually the bottom four or five feet of your well. So if you have a 200 foot sand and gravel well, your water is actually coming in the well from 195 to 200. So that's pretty far from the surface. Whereas a bedrock well, the bedrock itself acts as the casing under after a certain depth. So once you hit bedrock, um, you'd case the well all the way down to the bedrock and usually 10 to 20 feet in. And then after that, it's an open hole. And that's so that, uh, you know, water doesn't actually come from the rock. It comes from the fractures in the rock. So it's like a piping system or a conduit system. And so you need to have those fractures open to the well so that water can actually flow into your well when you start pumping it. So it depends on how deep your, your the bedrock is. There's places where bedrock's right near the surface. 
And before well construction code, we see wells that, that are 200 feet deep that maybe only have 30 feet or 20 feet of casing, which means your well is really susceptible to surface contamination or shallow conditions from 30 feet on down because it's open hole. And if those fractures happen to come back to the surface, um, it's the same thing. So, uh, so what I've listed here is um, if you have a shallow well, like a dug well, like the one I grew up on, you can have issues with, uh, you know, if it's the water table, uh, infiltration, direct infiltration into a well, uh, or and so it's really dependent on location. You know, our well was actually in the middle of a feet of a of a pasture, and that's a problem uh, because there are livestock near our well. Um, I mentioned sand points already; they're shallow, they have no grout. Um, and they're typically in sandy areas, which may be irrigated or certainly agricultural. Uh, vulnerable geologies, if it's really high permeable, again, sand or karst, where, you know, karst is bedrock that's uh, easily dissolved by water. So you have sinkholes, it's where, you know, caves, all those sorts of things, they all create large conduits from the surface down to the aquifer. And, and I know, like, for instance, uh, the head of my section, my boss, has done a lot of work in Southern Illinois looking at karst geology and how much it affects uh, water quality. We have counties that are mostly karst where 80% of the private well samples come back positive for bacteria and no matter how deep they are. And it's because of uh, that vulnerable geology. So, and then the other problem is your well itself. If it's not properly sealed, the, you know, the well cap isn't on right, you know, there's there's bolts missing. I mentioned the tree root example. I'll mention the Nebraska grout study. So the state of Nebraska, their Department of Health and Human Services, did a study working with a grout company where they used see-through pipe, basically, or you know, clear PVC uh, or some kind of plastic, and they put grout in under different geologic conditions, and they watched what happened. Um, grout's mostly liquid. It can be a mixture of certain percentages of solids and liquids, and it's mostly clay. Uh, and what they found is under certain geologies, that grout did not stay in the borehole. It moved out into the formation. So effectively, there was no more grout. So if your well isn't properly protected at the surface, it can run along the outside of the pipe and get down into where it becomes part of your water supply. And so the uh, the funny part about that was, I think that study was in the early 2000s, and the folks in Nebraska certainly expected most states to change their well code. Well, Nebraska is the only one that did, and I know I, I think it was New Mexico. I talked to someone from the state where they're looking at changing their code now because of that. But no one else has even changed their well code knowing that that's an issue. It's just it's a, too much of a lift, if you will, with their state legislatures. Um, and the other thing is no sanitary well cap or not properly sealed to the surface. We've all seen these. I'll show you examples on the next slide. But, you know, we had a goat in a well, right? And a horse in a well, that well wasn't being used. But um, a lot of things can get in wells. And uh, like the well in the upper left here, that's an actual well that's in use by the farmstead that's up in the very upper right corner of that picture. The reason that looks like mud and dirt and those poles look so worn is because that's the pasture where cattle come and rub. So it's an old dug well. Uh, cattle come up there and rub uh, to scratch and uh, do everything else there. Um, it's shallow brick lined. There's two by tens and pieces of tin uh, with cement blocks holding in place. You know, uh, rats, snakes, you name it, can get in there. And so, uh, and then the one on the lower left is an actual well from one of the RCAP folks where the whole thing got broken off and they've just got it sitting there at ground surface. So, you know, anything can get kicked in there or fall in there and um, and we see frogs in wells sometimes, or toads, and you name it. Uh, this is just not the way to have your well. It's your drinking water supply. Okay, so coliform versus E. coli. Several people ask questions about having total, total coliform in their well with no mention of E. coli at all. So, you know, total coliform isn't necessarily a health risk, but it means that there's a pathway into your well for other things like E. coli, or it's likely they could be there. So, you know, one of the first things to do is to test for E. coli because that certainly is a risk. But uh, to answer a couple of questions related to this, there is no safe level of coliform bacteria in your well because it means that your well's not safe. It means that there's uh, a broken piece of something or it's not sealed properly and other things can get in there from the surface. So if you apply pesticides in your yard or if somebody spills something nearby, it's likely gonna get into your well. Um, and so uh, what we've what I've done is um, 
there's this good reference from the Wisconsin, uh, Washington State Department of Health, and it's actually about community water systems, but it's really appropriate because it explains the difference between coliform E. coli and fecal coliform. And, um, you know, even with just coliform bacteria in your well, you should boil your water before you drink it until um, you've disinfected and you've retested to confirm that there is no longer a bacteria problem. And I'll get into that more, but, you know, if there is still a bacteria problem, you can re- uh, uh, disinfect your well, but in some cases it's a source that you can't do anything about, and it's always going to come back, and uh, so that's that's an issue. And this is that uh, fact sheet, and uh, again you'll be able to get to this. Um, you can either email us, um, or if you wait till the video is available, um, you can go online and see. Uh, which if I go back, it, it's kind of a long uh, URL. Um, so things to consider. What, so what do you do? Um, one, you need to understand your well construction, geology, and water source. Is it a shallow well? Is it possible that it's just too close to, to my septic system or a feedlot where there's cows or pigs or whatever uh, that are affecting it? Or is it, you know, is it the well itself, the construction? Is it in a pit? Does the, are there, is the cat missing? You know, is it an old dug well? It's getting water from near the surface. Understanding those things and fixing them would be part of the solution. And then when you disinfect your well, um, I'm gonna go through what we tell people to use, uh, which isn't perfect, but it's probably the best thing out there. And then once you've disinfected, you retest it, you see it's gone and boil until then. And if so if, it's, if it is clean, then you can go back to testing annually and uh, assuming your well's safe or if there's something you wanna change on your well, that'd be a good time. But if it's not, it's worth chlorinating at least one more time to see. Sometimes there can even be layers of bacterial scale just because it's been so long and you've never uh, chlorinated it before. Uh, things to remember, chlorine's ineffective above a pH of eight. Matter of fact, I found, um, I have to verify it, but I, um, we know that pH becomes ineffective and it takes, um, someone had told me 100 times more chlorine over a pH of eight. Um, what I know uh, from looking at some information today is that at a pH of six, chlorine's 90% effective at killing bacteria, or 97% of it's available to kill bacteria. But at pH eight, it's more like 25%, and at eight and a half, it's only 9%. So you're putting in, you know, 20 gallons of a, of a solution, say at 200 parts per million of chlorine, um, you know, it can, if a pH is six, it's going to do the job a much better than if the pH is eight and a half. And so that matters. Um, and so then the other thing is, if it's not, uh, if you need to make sure you disinfect enough, if you will, and then uh, a local source life livestock or septic or karst, it's going to come back. And I, I know I already mentioned that. But so your solutions to that are continuous disinfection, which means you add a you know, inject chlorine all the time, or you have a UV uh, ultraviolet uh, a filter that you run the water through to kill bacteria, um, or H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Um, there's more uh, of that. I don't know a lot about it because it's kind of a newer approach, um, but you can ask a treatment dealer about that um, for one thing. And uh, if it's the well, repair the well, bring it up to code, make sure it's properly sealed. And if none of those things work or you don't wanna do either of those things, your other option is to drill a different well into a deeper aquifer or at a different location that's away from the source. So we already showed that example, the geology, where maybe you have an old uh, board well or dug well that's only you know 20 or 30 feet deep, um, maybe below you at 200 feet is a nice bedrock or sand and gravel aquifer, if it is, um, it's much less likely that surface contamination would be a problem if your well is properly constructed and the borehole is properly sealed, which, you know, like I said, in every state but two, uh, it's legally required to be so. So as far as disinfecting, um, we use the Minnesota Department of Health's guide for water well and water system disinfection. And so, uh, you know, someone had asked the question about pouring bleach in on a regular basis. Uh, and they said, is it a wife's tale or not? And uh, it's actually really a bad idea to pour chlorine straight into your well, just on a schedule. You know, I ran into a well owner in Northern Illinois who said, well, my contractor told me just to put a cup of bleach in it every month and it'd be fine. That does nothing uh, except harm your well. So straight bleach is, a too, is too concentrated. So especially in areas in Illinois where you have 
pitless adapters because you know we have a frost line in the winter. Um, those things are really hard on rubber seals and components. Also, it's an oxidant, and so the metals like the brass uh, in your pump, um, it can leach some of that material into the water. And so um, you need to mix it to a certain concentration, which this document explains, and uh, it won't be harmful to your components, and you mix it and you have a volume that equals what you need based on the size, the diameter and depth of your well. So in our class lessons under lesson 10, uh, which is called Water Treatment Solutions, uh, there's a link to this, and I believe uh, we provided it, uh, oh, I thought I I might have forgot to take a slide out here. Um, yeah, so as you go through this, it's got a diagram that tells you, depending on the uh, diameter of your well, and there's other things available. You're trying to mix to a certain concentration here, and so, um, and sometimes it even says here, you may have to, if it hasn't been disinfected in a long time, it may have a bunch of scale buildup that's protecting that bacteria, so you may need to do it more than once. It even talks about what to do with uh, treatment devices and recommends going to the Water Quality Association, which lists all those treatment vendors and may have those uh, all those guides if you don't have yours anymore uh, for some of that treatment device. Some you want to take offline, some you want to just remove the filter, uh, you know, it just depends. And so, um, yeah, and so uh, moving on, um, why do I have to shock chlorinate my well more than once if I use the proper dose of chlorine. Well, um, sometimes they can build up in layers, as I mentioned. So when you chlorate, it might kill the upper layer, but there's still some there and it sloughs off a layer. And so, uh, especially when you're talking about bacteria that cause sulfur smell, like iron bacteria, there could be quite a colony there. And I know that's not um, a health issue there. It's more of a taste and odor issue. But um, th that's a situation you might find yourself in. Or it could be a continuous source. And so if it is, uh, it's really in vain because eventually you're going to need to add continuous disinfection because all the water is going to end up being contaminated. It comes through the system because there's a continual source of bacteria being supplied to the well. Um, we know that pH above 8 isn't nearly as effective. Um, and what I want to say about that is Virginia Tech and uh, actually one of the researchers that just moved to Northeastern University is working on this. Um, what do we do when the pH is high? Because um, our advice is to tell people to use chlorine, and uh, that's the best advice we have. Uh, there are other approaches, uh, but not necessarily just to shock chlorinate your well. That's more for a continuous, you know, UV for continuous disinfection. And so, um, you know, we've heard anecdotal evidence of people using other chemicals in a well to lower the pH first and then adding the chlorine, but again, chlorine raises pH, so the more you add, the more the pH goes up, and it's hard to control, and we're not all um, able to uh, scientifically mix all that water and be sure the pH is low enough that the chlorine's being effective and all those things, so we're working, um, and we're kind of waiting and, and counting on those guys, uh, which I expect will happen in a year or so. Um, on better guidance uh, for well owners whenever they have one of those situations. Um, yeah, so chlorine also reacts with things. So um, when you disinfect your well, you know, what you do basically is you mix in enough chlorine uh, solution that, uh, and then you run it through, uh, that the well's mixed, thoroughly mixed, and then you run that water through all of the hydrants, pipes, bathtubs, toilets, everything in your showers, in your house, at every tap when you turn it on, you leave it on until you smell chlorine, then you turn it off, and you do that with every water outlet you have, and you let it sit overnight. Um, you know, I think it recommends at least six to eight hours. And th that way the chlorine's in, those, in your piping system, and it can actually do its job. It needs contact time to kill bacteria. And so if you put chlorine in, and you mixed it at what you think is the right uh, level based on what should be the water in your well, and you're not smelling chlorine, then you need to add a higher dose. And so uh, that's something uh, that could happen. Uh, it's not very common, but it's something to be aware of. You want to smell chlorine whenever you turn on the tap when it's going to sit overnight. And if you're worried about that, uh, you know, the next day you turn everything on until there's no more chlorine smell, and so you're flushing it out of your system, uh, your whole well system. And so it won't be a risk like for leaching metals and things like that um, once you've done that. 
Uh, so removing iron and manganese. What's the best way to remove iron and manganese from my water? Um, so, you know, we, and this is Dan who's retired. This was something we've been asked before, but he would, you know, suggest starting with a micron, a five micron filter. And so anything that's already been oxidized or if it's in solid form um, can be taken out prior to any kind of treatment you might have, because sometimes that's part of the problem is uh, the iron oxide, uh, the oxidized iron and manganese, you know, they cause staining and everything else. Um, but if you if it's still higher, you want to remove it, especially now there's some evidence that suggests manganese may have health effects. And I know there's a number of states that have passed their own rules and Canada has as well, uh, suggesting that uh, you don't want to have higher manganese because it can have neurological effects. But um, so if that's not enough, usually your softener will be enough or you can get a softener that's meant uh, to remove iron and uh, those uh, work pretty well. But if you really don't want soft water, some people don't, then you can go to an iron filter, which involves actually oxidizing the dissolved iron and manganese uh, before the filter and so that it does come out uh, in the filter and it changes it to a solid form, uh, manganese and iron dioxide. And so um, you just have to watch your filter because they can fill up. And once uh, all the pores, or if you will, are all clogged, um, you have to change out your filter or you're not going to get uh, any. It's going to go around and bypass it. And this is actually an example of uh, a new filter on the left and a filter that removes, uh, has removed a lot of iron and manganese. And he has to replace that every two months. Um, but it's doing what it's supposed to do. That's why that looks so black. And if it was just iron, it would be more of a rusty red color, but the manganese uh, is also being removed and that makes it that color. So radon, someone asked about radon. Um, so, he, you know, uh, my boss actually has some experience with radon, but it's uh, usually just in trying to sample and collect samples, which is really difficult to do. You have to use an inverted bottle and all this stuff. But um, what we found is uh, through the EPA's page, and so that's what we're recommending here, is you go to EPA's uh, legacy um, archive page on radon and drinking water. Um, basically, it's more of an inhalation issue, but it can also be a concern in drinking water. And so if you just Google uh, radon and drinking water, the EPA page will be the first link. And then uh, there's three tabs on that first page, and the middle one says basic information about radon and drinking water. And I took this right from their page. They estimate radon uh, in drinking water causes about 168 cancer deaths per year, 89% from lung cancer caused by breathing radon released whenever uh, the water's turned on and it's volatilizing out, and 11% from stomach cancer caused by consuming um, water containing radon. You know, I'm not really trying to alarm anybody here, um, but if you have radon issues um, in your home, you know, most of that's coming from a decay of uranium in the soils below your home. Um, you can certainly uh, look at this page for advice. And uh, this is what that looks like. So this is actually, I've already clicked on the middle thing that says uh, basic information about radon and drinking water, the middle tab. And there's a whole page of information there that you can uh, read from EPA. So uh, we got this question this time, which uh, I think it's the first time it's ever come up. Um, but how do I dissuade a customer from testing for everything? You know, in this case, um, you know, is there a good source to explain why nitrate, nitrite, and bacteriological testing can negate the need for further testing? Um, that's absolutely not true. Um, nitrate and bacteria, as I've tried to explain today, really are an indicator that there's a pathway into your well, nothing more. They don't say anything about lead, arsenic, uranium, any other metals. They, they, they have, no correlation. We did a study back in the 90s looking at nitrate versus pesticides and the correlation even between those, which, you know, we're in an agricultural state and we're in an agricultural area sampling shallow wells, um, there was no correlation. Sometimes we saw pesticides, sometimes we saw nitrate, sometimes we saw both. And so they, you can't use those to say anything but uh, levels of nitrate and bacteria. So what I tell homeowners and well owners, and I tell realtors and environmental health professionals and everyone, is that it's buyer beware. Um, you know, I would never buy a home without testing for all the things we've recommended. And I'd also ask the local health department first about other natural contaminants, again, like uranium and beryllium, um, depending on where I was moving to, um, just because it's really a problem. And I'm gonna give you two examples. 
So Macon County, Illinois, uh, you know, I'm in Illinois and I work for the, our state agency and we house the state's well logs. So I had a well owner call me from Macon County who bought a house uh, three years prior and they only tested it for coliform and nitrate. And uh, that was all that was needed. You know, they rushed through, got got their loan and, and all that stuff. So three years later, there's an article in the paper about um, some local shallow aquifers being uh, having arsenic. So she had her well tested and it had 150 ppb of arsenic in it. She called me and chewed me out for the state not protecting her better. And I tried to explain to her that, you know, it would require a state legislature to pass rules that will probably never happen in Illinois because uh, we're an agricultural state when we're a real, you know, property uh, right state, if you will, where everyone wants the government to leave them alone. So you're on your own if you're going to buy property to make sure that you take care of yourself. And again, I'd never buy a property without testing it. We get calls all the time from people saying, I need to decide today or I'm going to lose this house. And, and I tell them this, you can either go ahead and buy it and take the chance that you're going to have to put in several thousand dollars of treatment that costs several hundred dollars a year to maintain, or you can Tell them you're going to test the water first and make sure it's what you want. Um, and all the extra testing that goes along with ensuring that your treatment device is working the way it's supposed to. Because it is. It's on you. You're on your own. And that's the thing you need to really remember. The second example, Deb, it's a colleague who purchased a house just south of Champaign-Urbana where we live. Um, we know the shallow aquifer has arsenic in it. When they were getting ready to buy their property, we recommended, uh, told them, hey, I wouldn't test. Uh, you're on a well water. I wouldn't uh, buy that until you tested it. Well, they tested it. It had 78 ppb of arsenic. Um, so it just turned out that a new subdivision had went in across the road and it was part of our city water supply. So they contacted our water supply, found out what it would cost to run a line under the road. And it was, you know, I don't, I don't remember the exact amount. Let's say it was $4,000. Um, so they chose rather than to deal with the well that has high arsenic and groundwater that naturally has high arsenic, they chose to hook up to the city water supply. They're very fortunate that they only had to go across the road, um, but I think that's the best $4,000 they could have spent if they're going to live there a long time. Um, you know, it's a young couple planning to have kids, all that stuff, um, and be in the area a long time. Um, you know, you're better off on city water in almost every case, in my opinion, because there's someone who's testing the water to make sure it's safe. There's someone making sure the pipes run to your home all work all the time and making sure that you have water pressure and that uh, you're being protected. And so, because uh, there's a lot of well owners who ask questions that make it clear they really know nothing about their well. And if they're not gonna learn that information and become informed and really take it seriously, they're asking for trouble down the road with them or their family's health. So um, it does matter. And um, you know, it's important that you test, even though most well owners have never done that, as it turns out. So uh, near the end here, uh, are home test kits adequate to test my water, uh, at sh or should I always use lab? So we can't recommend any kind of kit per se, but um, you know we've tested some of those, and in some cases they may work sometimes. And uh, you know there's a lot of tricky things like units I mentioned before, also uh, misleading words. So if they say pesticides, there's no one test that tests for all pesticides. You can't do it. So if they say it tests for pesticides, uh, they're not telling the truth. That's the bottom line, at least not for all of them. And so, uh, and if it says EPA on it, uh, I, you know, I'd, I'm almost assured that EP, the US EPA hasn't endorsed their product. And so, uh, it's important to follow the instructions. Again, I said, as we've we've tested some of these things, there's a lot of false positives and false negatives. So even if I was going to use a, a kit that I bought in a store to kind of screen uh, to see if there might be something really high, it's bound to show up, right? Um, not so. And if it came out really high, especially, I would uh, send the sample to a lab then to verify that. And if it comes out negative, um, you don't have 100% confidence that it's not a false negative and that you actually have something there. So we really would not recommend uh, using a home test kit, but then for some basic things like, uh, you know, they use for pools or aquariums, you know, pH and alkalinity and some of those things. Uh, you know, Dan was a, uh, is a, a big aquarium guy and uh, he, there's some of those he's found that he really likes and uses, uh, but just for those basic things. Um, so I want to mention this now because it's not on our um, 
website yet, but it probably will be in a couple of days. And that's my fault for not asking Katie to put it up yet. But on February 11th, we're going to do a joint webinar with the Association of Public Health Labs and the Water Quality Association to focus just on these questions. Why test and what to test for, how to find and work with a lab, uh, how to understand your results and what you need to know about treatment and treatment providers. And uh, it's a really, uh, it's by far the majority of the questions we get are related to these topics. Um, every webinar, even the septic webinar, we get a bunch of questions about testing and treatment and all that stuff. So um, we're pretty excited about it. The, the folks who have agreed to uh, present with us uh, should be really interesting and useful. And uh, again, that's on February 11th. And I just wanted to mention that um, because, yeah, I think it'll be worth your time. And it will be recorded like all the others. So, um, and that's what I have. Um, so the first question is, can we mention the sampling tools website again? Um, it's the Be Well Informed tool from the New Hampshire DES. Yeah. So um, if you just Google Be Well Informed tool or Be Well Informed uh, in HDES, it'll be one of the first few things there. And uh, it's pretty handy. So, um, yeah. And again, it asks you what town you're from in New Hampshire. And I think that's just so they can track, again, to show that it's being used and it's useful. Um, you can put anonymous if you choose to. And um, But yeah, it's interesting. We had these folks talk at our conference. We had a private well conference in 2017, and we had them talk about this new tool when it first came out. And now there's at least uh, six to eight states who are trying to build something similar using their code so they can provide it for the well owners in their states and provide additional information. So it is really, uh, it's the thing to use. Um, we have a, the second question. We have a well that is over 300 feet deep and have a submersible pump. The pH in my well is 5.6. What can I do to increase the pH of my well? I don't think there's really anything you can do to increase the pH of your well because it's not your well, it's the aquifer and the water in it. So groundwater is always moving and uh, the water you take out of it today may have been, depending on the flow direction, 100 yards away from your well two days ago or three yards away from your well two days ago, um, you know, so, or a quarter of a mile uh, if it's a really good aquifer. So there's no way you're going to change the pH of the of your well. Um, the thing to do is to uh, you'll have to add treatment. So what communities do is add polyphosphates um, to raise the pH. And um, I'm not an expert in those things. Um, and I would recommend you look at the Water Quality Association's website. You can find treatment dealers in your area from their website and talk to one of them about what you might do. And you can also again go to your health department, explain. Uh, and if someone knows, or maybe they'll refer you to someone from the state health agency or the state primacy agency that regulates the community water supplies in your state uh, to give you some advice there. Um, but yeah, and that's a, it's a common thing. Um, can you explain briefly what a well log is? Great question. I just assume everyone knows. So um, when you drill a well, the driller drills a well. So for instance, we're talking about Illinois just because uh, there's a law that says you have to file a log. So the driller uh, keeps track of the geology as he drills the hole, the and also the location, the size of the hole, the type of pipe he used, what kind of pump he put in it. And then once the well's drilled, they test pump it in most cases, and they can tell you what the flow rate is and what the water level change is based on, you know, like on our logs, it says uh, after you pumped so many gallons per minute for so many hours, the static level prior to pumping was, you know, say 20 feet and the pumping level was 30 feet, which means pumping it at, you know, 20 gallons a minute for two hours, drop the water level 10 feet in the well. You know, if that's a two or 300 foot well, it's in sand and gravel, that's great. Uh, you're not ever going to have a problem. But in some areas of the country where you have uh, a lot of uh, low yielding wells, I know there's some in Pennsylvania that only yield maybe one or two gallons a minute. It matters what kind of pump you put in because you can take all the water out of the well in a heartbeat and burn up your pump, for instance. So you'd put a low uh, yield pump in and then you'd pump it at a really low rate and, and may have to create an alternate way of storing water. So um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, in Illinois, it's a, you have to file it with a county and the county sends them to us for the whole state but it includes the geology, the well construction details, the date, the location, who drilled it, who the owner was, all the information that's pertinent uh, to a private well. So um, after treatment of a well with chlorine and still coliform present, when do you recommend drilling a new well? You know, it's really a case by case basis and I'm sorry, I don't have a better uh, feel for that. 
um, it, you know, your situation, I, again, I mentioned every well is unique. Um, whenever we go out and do well assessments, we never run into two that are identical, you know, either the way they store things around the well or the way the cap is or, you know, it, the driller is different. They may use different materials. So um, you really have to look at your situation. And um, again, this is honestly, this is a great place to have someone from RCAP, one of the Rural Community Assistance Partnership people working on this program, uh, to come out and uh, uh, do an assessment. And they would have a much better idea than if you have a person. And if you're in Illinois, um, you can call us because I mean that's part of our job. So, um, but if you're not, that's uh, then I would refer you to somebody else uh, who would be able to come out. Because I know, like you know, I mentioned Jim Starbert is a septic expert. He's in Massachusetts. He also works in Connecticut and Rhode Island. And I know he has a relationship with the Rhode Island Department of Health. That when they get a call from a well owner who has a real problem, a water quality problem, they don't necessarily have the staff to go out and investigate that. And so then they call Jim, and he goes out and does an assessment with the well owner, helps him. You know, our programs and uh, our cap and our program, um, which again. RCAP funds us, so we're a sub to them. But uh, so RCAP's program is funded by US EPA, and it's it's meant to be an outreach and education program to help people with their wells and also help protect your source water. So those same aquifers you may have a well in uh, may be supplying water to a community water supply as well. And you know it's important that you understand how to take care of that and make sure you're not even contaminating that water supply for somebody else. So, um, but email me if you will, and. Um, we can, or even you can call me. Uh, uh, I can send you my information, and we can talk about it. So, because we'll certainly try to get you some help. And I think that's the last question. I appreciate everyone's time. Ran a little long. I apologize. Um, I put some new material in this this time, so it's kind of different. So, um, again, if you're looking for CEUs or CEs, um, the forms to fill out or download are in the handouts thing. There's three of them. And then email us at info at and uh, Katie monitors that and will uh, uh, help you out. And I'm doing this from Katie's chair, which is kind of we're on the opposite ends of the building. I apologize. I forgot what's wrong with my computer. But uh, thanks again. If you have any other questions, you can email us. And, uh, yeah, that's all we have for today.